I want to start kind of at the very beginning. I, I like to get an understanding of uh, my guests' early years. So tell me a little bit about, oh, yep, Julie says, yep, she wants to know all about that too. So well, tell me um, about your family and um, siblings. Where were you born? What kind of family were you born into? Talk about your early years. Yeah, um, I was born in Washington, D.C., capital of the United States, very busy area, a lot of business going on, especially a lot of government contracts. Um, when I was born, my mom was working for a consulting agency. She actually still works for that. Can you believe, like, over 20 years, she still works for the same company? Wow. Um, but she's working for a consulting agency, Booz Allen, Hamilton, and my dad was a sales agent, I believe, at Johnson & Johnson. Grew up uh, right outside of D.C. in Maryland, Fort Washington, Maryland. Some of my family still live there to this day. A lot of my close family, though, was in Richmond, Virginia. My mom's side was in Richmond. My dad grew up in Richmond in a little suburb called Chesterfield. And so by the time I was six or seven, my parents divorced. They split ways. My dad you know, quit his job at, uh, at Johnson & Johnson. And he went off to be an entrepreneur. And my mom was looking totally other way, security, these kids, et cetera, and they just they just couldn't make it work. So I moved to Richmond with my mom and my brother. My brother's uh, 18 months older, so we're really close in age. A wow. Lot of has, Wait, what do they call that? Oh, I think they call them Irish twins. Oh, really? Is that what it's called? Nice. Yeah, they're called Irish twins if they're born, well, actually, technically within, I think, 14 months or something like that. Because okay. the Catholics used to close have enough. one. <laughs> close enough. Anyhow, yeah. So, uh, and is he older or younger? He's older. He's older. So he's only only a couple, like, I guess a little over a year older. And so people always ask, like, oh, is your brother protective? You know, when you have, like, boyfriends and stuff. And I think we're too close in age. Like, we kind of look at each other as equal. It's not like he is, like, here to protect my world. And so anyway, growing up was really fun. My brother and I have, have complete opposite personalities, especially as we were growing up. I was very introverted and to myself. And I was always... Wait, wait, did yeah. you say you were introverted? Yeah, I honestly, if wow. you told me back then that I'd be doing what I'm doing today, I, I would have said you got the wrong, you got the wrong one. <laughs> yeah, I was extremely introverted. And um, growing up, I usually only had like one or two friends. I didn't ever have like a huge friend group or go to parties. I would always hang out with like one or two close friends. Whereas my brother is like the name of the school. Like everybody knows him, everybody, he's going to every outing. I remember in high school, there was points in time where people would address me as Anderson's little sister. Like that's how bad it was. Like nobody knew who I was. <laughs> but wow. overall, you know, since I grew up majority of the time with my mom, I'd go visit my dad in uh, DC and Maryland some weekends. I started playing soccer when I was little, which gave me a little bit of ambition, competition. But overall, growing up, my mom designed our life in a way where the path was set, right? You, you'd go to school, you'd go out of school, you'd go to college, you'd get a great job. My mom has a PhD in education. She was a high school teacher before she worked for this consulting agency. So she believed in education more than she believed in anything. It's like, here's the Bible, here's Christianity. Second belief, education. Like, that is the way to go. And so oh, the path on, she's got said, her doctorate in it. What do you expect? I mean, you know, yeah. she's that's a lot of studying. And a lot of studying. it is. So you have, is you know, you've got to know the uh, the field. I mean, I, I've worked with a lot of PhD students because I managed uh, PhD and master's programs in different fields. I never handled education, but they know a lot. They have that's why they're called doctorates, right? Yeah. So wow. Yeah. Okay. I can see that she laid it out and she was thinking she's doing the best. Okay. <laughs> yes. So I, I'm almost afraid to ask when, what happened? What happened? Um, right? what <laughs> <do>? <laughs> so, you know, overall, my brother and I grew up in a very like uh, encouraging environment. You know, we want to be the best. We want to do the best after school during summers. My mom would create assignments for us to get ahead, for us to learn more. For us to always be developing ourselves. So I'm lucky, I'm lucky that those core values I've had since I was a little kid. Now, fast forward to senior year, I start this is Corona. I was just when I when Corona hit, it was 2020. I was a junior in high school. And at that time, there was nothing for me to do except 
learn. You know, in my free time, what I spent my time doing was either playing soccer, working out, or reading some book. I was a nerd. I was just the number one on my Clifton strengths is learner. So I was soaking in information. At this time, also, my mom got remarried and moved to Florida. So I didn't even have a chance to hang out with friends during Corona. There was no one. I knew no one. My brother was in college. He's one year older. It was my junior year. He graduated. Um, so it was just me. And I spent that time learning about real estate. Jerry Norton came up. Rich Dad, Poor Dad came up. Wait, 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 wait a second. What's up? Okay. <laughs> I'm absorbing the fact that you happen to be a COVID kid, um, you know, because that's, that's, a, that's a, a generation which has challenges, you know, not having the normal socialization yeah. and the opportunities and everything else and having the world stop that has to there was it has been a lot of concern about that affecting people negatively yeah. so you not only had that but you moved to florida yeah it was actually crazy because when when corona hit my mom had just gotten remarried like a couple months before and um my stepdad is from florida my mom's like lifelong dream for some odd reason was to live in florida and so they were like you know what this is the perfect opportunity we want to move to Florida. And I'm lucky. I'm lucky because they asked me, hey, we know it's your junior year. We know that you've grown up here. Do you want to move to Florida? And because because my brother had graduated, the whole school knew him and not me. I was like, you know, no one's going to even know that I'm gone. I don't have anything here waiting for me. Let's go to Florida. That was my mindset. That's hysterical. <laughs> that's hysterical. Um, okay, so that's one of the things I wanted to ask because it is an unusual so sort of situation. Who is Facebook user? Facebook Should we ban user. this person? I don't know. They're being supportive. They're saying yeah. nice things, but who is it? <laughs> okay, I'm just laughing. It's like no name, right? Um, so tell me this. When you were exploring on the internet and playing, yeah. oh, it's Birdie. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Nice. <laughs> Definitely go with Birdie. Yeah, yeah, Birdie, for sure. But oh, that's hysterical. Wouldn't it be funny if she wrote, this is Pace? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's and, no way Pace would come on as a Facebook user. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, but when you started playing with the internet and learning, real estate, well, two things. What did you want to go to school for prior to meeting real estate? And how and why did you meet real estate? The, the internet's really big, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. So those two questions. So the first thing being, since my mom set this path, my brother and I were always high achievers. My brother had a little bit harder time in school than I did, but we were both like, we wanted to do big things. And since I was a kid, you know, grades one through 12, before I said, okay, maybe real estate, I wanted to do whatever was the best. I said at some point I want to be a surgeon, a brain surgeon, not a regular surgeon, a brain surgeon. I said I want to be an engineer. And all of these things were kind of like buzzwords. I just knew I wanted to do something great. You know, I wanted to do something big. And so before I ever discovered real estate, I entertained a lot of these like really technical and high level positions that you just can't do unless you're willing to put in the years to study. Obviously following in the footsteps of my mom, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but how did i come across real estate in the first place uh again so i'm a huge learner and one time i was i was traveling this is my junior year of high school i was traveling to my my father's house in um in maryland and i brought a fiction book you know i always like reading i spent my free time reading i think before 2020 before covid i think a lot of people had better things to do than scroll on their phone all day just personally i've seen like a huge addiction crisis yeah. Um, yep. like social media. But anyway, I used to read a lot. I still do. And I brought one fiction book for like a whole summer at my dad's house. And obviously I finished it early. <laughs> and I was just like, well, I have nothing else to read for the whole summer. So I went down to my dad's library and I was just scanning his library. And there was one book in particular that caught my attention. And that was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And I mm -hmm. read that book in like a week and I was obsessed. I was researching what are the other books like this how can I didn't know I could take control of my life. I didn't know that I can create whatever I want to create. I didn't even know that there were riches available to me. I thought that me going to get a job was the best way to build my life and build my lifestyle. And so when I put when I put those inputs into Google, YouTube, et cetera, it spit back out 
crazy amounts of self-development, real estate, investing, and then I just got hooked. And from my junior year to the end of my senior year, say to like mid of my senior year, I was obsessed. But I was also in analysis paralysis. You know, I was learning, but I wasn't doing anything. And that was well, that's understandable because you still had your last year. So yeah. let's talk about this part. When you came across real estate, who were the people that first affected you? Like, you know, really helped you become interested. You started yeah. to say it a little bit and I was like, wait, wait, wait. I want to pay attention to this part because yeah. I hope that I'm right when I say when you're my age, there will hopefully still never have been another COVID. And, and everyone's going to say, really? You really didn't play with each other? You didn't do this? Didn't do that? Um, because it's not optimum. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I wanted to pay attention to that. But tell me about um, who did grab your interest first and who, you know, what sort of things you looked at. Besides, you know, it's not analysis paralysis, you know. It's, it's, it's just clear. being like a deer in the headlights. You know, they're looking at the light and they're like, oh, my God. What is that? Yeah. It's a God, you know, and until and they move out of the light, do they realize, shit, it's a car. It's going to hit me. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh you know, I think that um, you got to give yourself a bit of a break. I mean, it was over, oh it, it's overwhelming for adults, you know, for someone who's still relatively young. It must have been, you know, very much. It was uh, like a new world. Exactly. Sailing. So, um, um, rich dad, uh, poor dad, rich dad, rich dad. That was the dad. first thing. That was the first thing. Cause I, you know, I was already reading books. I was like, what's the next book on this? And then after that, it was, I was watching Jerry Norton almost, you know, the whole day, eight hours a day, how to wholesale, how to call an agent, how to talk to an agent, how to comp, how to underwrite, just everything. I was taking notes, learning everything. And the, the, the crazy part about this is once school started again, it was like, you know, okay, great. Those notes were good, but I'm a senior. Like there was a period of time, I would say at least seven or eight months where I, I sat with this information and I literally did nothing with it, which is okay. That's, that's life. That's the process that was meant for my journey. Um, and the only time that it came, the information came back up. So how, how this is now I've learned, I've done nothing. How did I end up here? The information came back up when my senior year came. I was applying to colleges. Georgia Tech gave me a scholarship. I was going for um, biomedical engineering, which again wow. sounds, really cool. sounds really cool and fancy. And it I is know hard. biomedical engineering because it was one of the programs I had for a short time. Yeah, it's a uh, it's not. And you got a scholarship. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I would have been so excited for you. I am excited. I was excited and my whole family was excited because up until this point, there was nothing else I wanted to do but go to the best school and get the best degree and get the best job and achieve things, right? But the information came back up the summer that I went to Georgia Tech because the first two weeks that I was there, I realized that I was largely out of place. I didn't like anything about it. I didn't like going to class. I didn't like what I was learning about. I didn't like the campus. I didn't like the people. I was just... I didn't like anything. And I was shocked. I was uncomfortable because for the first time in my life, I didn't like something and I was choosing to be there. You know, we've all been in school, in the high school, or the middle school, and we're not, we don't want to be there, but you have to, you have to finish high school. Everybody knows that. But I chose this college and I just couldn't, I'm even getting goosebumps thinking about it now. I just couldn't get over the fact that I was choosing something consciously that I didn't want to do. It was so uncomfortable. It was so it just felt disgusting. You can see the look on my face, I'm sure, because I remember those moments. I was so confused on why I was following, you know, what, something that I didn't want for myself. And so, so the whole experience was negative. I mean, of course, I made like one or two good friends, like my habits had proven me to. But for the most part, there was nothing about the school that was particularly interesting or exciting for me to be there. Um, so, so that's interesting. when my kids were little, I used to send them to summer camps uh, wherever I could to the best schools, mm -hmm. best universities. I wanted them to step on those campuses um, as a young child, eight, nine, 11, 15. 
so that they knew that there was nothing big and de- a big deal about it mm-hmm. and that they understood whether they were comfortable or not. Yeah. Uh, so, terrible. yeah, well, I figured, you know, um, I don't want them to th- think small. I want them to think big. And uh, one of the ways that a lot of very rich people do that is they send their kids, and we were rich then, uh, they send their kids to summer camps at the Ivy Leagues, at the best schools. Yeah. So that the kids, you know, you don't tell them I'm sending you uh, here or there. They just go and they're like, yeah, you know, oh, okay. You know, so it, it, it doesn't overwhelm them like it does when they're in the last year of high school necessarily. But that must have been a big shock for you. It was weird. It was definitely weird because everything that I said I wanted, I got and I wasn't happy. Um, and so that summer, I, I remember I made a presentation. It was like 12 slides to my parents. And the title was why Georgia Tech might not be the school for me. I open my laptop and their face is like, they just like, they just lose. It. They're like, what? They, they, they say, have you lost your mind? Like, you have a scholarship. This isn't just like, you know, you like you are turning down. You're trying to walk away from an opportunity that millions of people don't have. I don't understand. And I couldn't I couldn't give a good enough reason other than the way that I felt. And I didn't feel confident at that time for, for my feelings to be enough of a reason. So I said, I closed my laptop. I said, okay, you guys are probably right. You know, they said, just go in the fall. It'll be different. Cause I went for a summer period of summer to get started early as you know, my mom would, would like me to do right. As, as we were taught, get ahead. Um, and I went in the fall for first, first four weeks or six weeks of the fall were great. You know, there's excitement on campus. More people are there. Clubs are getting intro but as I started to get into the routine, that same sad, unfortunate feeling, you know, came into my heart. Where I was just like, this is just not for me. And that's when, that is when the real estate knowledge came back up. Because if I'm not going to do this, what am I going to do? Right? What am I going to do? Over the course of the fall semester, I asked again and again and again to my parents for permission to leave. No, 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 no. That October, um, I turned 18, my first semester in college. And I said, you know what? I'm an adult now. The last day to submit documents to take a leave of absence was November 3rd. I didn't ask. I just wrote up the paperwork and I submitted it. And I was like, I'm done. I booked an Airbnb for a month just in case I wasn't welcome back home because of my decision. (laughs) Um, Fortunately, I was. But but that's how the real estate idea came back up. It was really kind of born and motivated out of discomfort. And, you know, something's got to change. So did you know when you were doing that, that it was going to be real estate or was it a case of, well, I'm going to try this. And if it works, it works. If not, I'm going to look for something else. Yeah, it was, it was, I'm going to try. And that's exactly why today I'm a dropout. And then I was taking a leave of absence because if I took a semester off and it didn't work, I was just going to say, okay, look, sometimes you have to do stuff you don't like. And I was going to finish the four years. But I took a leave of absence. Obviously, I never went back, so I technically dropped out. But at that time, the difference between the two was major, dropping out versus a leave of absence. And so I took that time off to try it. And, you know, thankfully, with the motivation, with the excitement, with the drive and initiative, persistence, et cetera, um, I am where I am today. I love it. I just love it. So uh, (laughs) Brandy says, wow, so young and thinking so big. I'm loving the inspiration. Yeah, I know. It's just, it's an amazing story. And I mean, it's an amazing life and it's just getting started. That's the the really interesting thing. So talk to us about that month. Did you get a need to use the Airbnb? Um, No, okay. (laughs) Luckily, when I told my mom, my mom was really upset for about a period of a week. On day eight, she was like, respect respect you know i don't support this and you're still gonna do it i can i see something here and she was just like whatever you're trying to do come back home to do it and we'll see how it goes and i even tried to like pay rent and like do my part she wouldn't accept it i think she truly wanted me to be successful in whatever it is i wanted to pursue at that time which i'm so grateful for i I wouldn't be where i am without the support of my mom and i I tell her that all the time she changed the trajectory of my career um, but yeah, she welcomed me back home the week after I dropped out. I was fish like I left school. I was at my first real estate meetup, shaking hands, meeting people, and that's where I got my first opportunity to be a sales agent at a wholesale company. 
And I started oh. calling leads for this company. Where um, was the meetup? Who were the people involved? You know, I want details. <laughs> so it was a, wait it was till a we get to, wait till we get to uh, when you start um, having. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was Tell Maria. Me. You know, real estate investing association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all have nice. seen the guys with uh, you know lots of lots of experience in real estate all meet up there to do deals together, right? Just search Orlando meet up near me real estate, and that was the first one that came up. I went there. And I met a guy in particular who was doing at that time a million about a million dollars a month in wholesale revenue. This was this nice. was the beginning of 2022, end of 2021. So this is when the market was still like really hot. Keep that in yeah. mind. The market has turned, it's shifted, it's it's done lots of weird things over the last few years. But at this time, anything and everything was flying off the shelves. So this individual was doing a million dollars a month in wholesale revenue. And I was just like, this guy knows something I don't know. I'm going to figure out how to work with him. And so I was driving for dollars, you know, driving around my neighborhoods, looking for distressed property. I landed a couple appointments. I didn't know how to talk to people. I didn't know what I was talking about. So I asked this individual for help and he helped me. And eventually I wasn't doing so well on my own just because you don't know what you don't know. You have to get mentorship. You have to get leadership. And he, he posted on his Instagram that he was hiring sales agents in his office. I said, look, I'll put everything that I'm doing behind me. I want to work for you. I want to learn. And the message that I sent him, I still remember it today. Like it was yesterday. I said, if you teach me everything, I'll make you a lot of money. And I sent the message three days later. I had a job commission only, but I had a job. Nice. Nice. Yeah. What? And it was wholesale. Yeah. So my job was to call these leads that had been in the system for years or months and lock up the contract over the phone. The, I was making hundreds of dials every single day. And the day three, literally, of, literally hundreds. Yeah, literally hundreds. Okay. Like, well, I used to be in sales and I, you know, there were times when I did a little over a hundred, but yeah, not hundreds. <laughs> the average on a daily basis was around 300 dials. And we had to have at least like four, four hours of talk time. I remember these next. Okay. Yeah. I remember all that. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. So, so on day three that I was there, I closed a deal and this was a lead that had been in the system for three years. You know, it was just, it wasn't even considered a hot lead. It was just like call these trash leads and see if like practice basically. And I closed the deal and I was like, wait a minute, I think I might have something here. Like, I think I have a new found skill. I can talk to people. I can connect with people. I'm good on the phone. And that built my confidence over three months. I worked for that company for three months. I closed 33 deals. Something about the three here. Wow. I closed 33 deals for that company. And I, I brought in, can't remember the exact number, but I brought in a lot of revenue, obviously, with a wholesale wow. deal averaging 10 to 40K on an assignment. When you say you closed it, did that mean that you get it under contract? Yes, over the phone. Over the phone. And then what would happen? Would so they had another they had another department that was responsible for disco. My job was to just close the deal. That's incredible. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And I like the fact that you su uh, saw it as practice. Like it doesn't matter what happens. It's just freaking practice. Because if you're going to feel confident in sales and go, 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 and keep the positive attitude, that's what you have to do. You have to yeah. look at it as, thank you for the practice. You know, like. So you hung up on me. All right. Thank you. I now know what that feels like. Keep going. You know, so otherwise uh, you end up, uh, that's when analysis paralysis steps in and you're like, ah, I don't want to take yeah. a chance. When did you start to become an extrovert? Because you have a smile that looks, you were, looks like you were born with it. You glow, oh you glow and you're so friendly. And you're, and even though when you look at your physique, you're really, really strong and hard, but you don't look scary. You look really approachable and right. welcoming. So when did that happen? That happened when I left that job because I was forced to be. I was forced to be. So I left that job. No longer could I hide behind the phones or just clock in to do my job. I was a full blown entrepreneur. And, <laughs> do, and because, when you become one, if you guys are out there and you're not one yet, you have to build relationships, especially in real estate. You, it's impossible to be successful in this business without building relationships, building good ones, having genuine connections. And so when I left that job, I started to read books like um, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Daniel Carnegie. 
I've started to really work on my presentation. How do people feel when they're around me? Do people like being around me? All those things so that I could build a successful business and, and inspire people to follow me and work with me, right? Yeah. Um, and I left that job and um, I had I had 13, I, I think $13,500 from that job in the three months that I worked there. And thank you. That's the first money. That's the first real money that I made. Um, before that, I had only ever been like a referee for youth soccer. But <laughs> I used. Oh, you had a whistle. You had a whistle. I did have a. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> true. So, um, what did you do with your money? And were you still at home? Tell us the next part. Yeah, I was still at home. You know, this is about. This is only four months after I dropped out of college. Four months after I dropped out, I had made thirteen thousand. That was like a pretty good record. I was like, I'm going to keep pursuing this. Um, during that time where I I left the company and before I joined Step Two with Pace Morby, it was very apparent that in order to be successful, you need mentorship, you need community. And since I had left my past community, this job, I had left my past mentor, my boss. I needed to now transition into a new community and mentor. But I knew I didn't want another job. I didn't drop out of school to go get a job being a sales agent. I dropped out to be successful in real estate. So I used my commission to join Sub2. And the only ah. reason I knew about Sub2 is because every morning at that job, we have a sales meeting, 9 a.m. sales meeting. And some of those mornings, they would play Pace Morby talking to a seller. And I was just like, you know what? I like that guy. Let me check out some of his videos. And I fell into the Sub2 funnel. And I, <laughs> I bet if that guy could go back, he wouldn't be showing you those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, Dang it. I lost that's her. Right. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's awesome. So you checked out the YouTube and you decided, okay, I'm giving my money to Pace. A hundred percent. You know, I talked to the person who gave me the program answered all my questions confidently. They set up a payment plan. Um, and I just was like, you know, thinking of this as my college, I was like, if I'm going to get somewhere, I have to invest in the education. So for me, it was, an, it was like a no brainer on those. Once I got all my questions answered, I was like, if this is what you say, this is, this is going to be largely helpful. So I'm willing to spend the money. Um, you know, you were really lucky. I know, right? Cause I could have told some way other stuff. <laughs> there are so many uh, mentors out there that would have gladly taken your money and given you very little. I know. I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky. Truly lucky. And you know, when I was in Canada and I couldn't do much, one of the things I could do was network. Uh, I couldn't believe how many people, and even to today, uh, belong to four to six mentorships. And we're talking between at least 100 to 200K in there. And they're like, but I'm learning. I'm like, you, you know. Should, you should be freaking billionaire status. <laughs> <laughs> so tell tell me when you joined? Uh April 2022. So Oh my god, Alexis. Yeah. Do you remember the day? Yeah. Uh well, I don't remember the day. No. I I joined April 13th, 2022. Oh wow. We joined around the same time. <laughs> That's funny. That's awesome. Now when did you join Gator? Cuz I joined Gator a little a couple weeks before. Man, I can't even remember the month I joined Gator. Probably a little over a year ago to the, to this date. Okay. Yeah. So Something you first came to my attention um, with uh, door knocking, but I don't know if that was the first thing you did when you joined, because you know how it is when we first joined. You know, you're like, the water hose is coming. I <laughs> feel oh, like a drowned rat. You know? So let me let me tell you this. So I was coming from that sales job. I needed a mentor. I was good at sales. I Close 33 contracts the the previous three months, and I just had spent half of my all of my money on this mentorship. Right, I had to allocate that, and I went into the nightly dial, which was a thing way back when. And most yep. people who go on the nightly dial are going to practice their sales. I went and closed the first two sellers I got on the phone. So everyone just like, who is this person? Where have you been? Welcome to the community. And because of that, um, because of that instance, I networked, I got to network with the highest level people in sub two because they were trying to recruit me on their team. <laughs> was, that like, Dan? <laughs> was that Daniel Kionis? Yeah, that was with Daniel. There was like a couple other people, the Bash Bros were in there. And so I very quickly I got connected to what I would say the movers and shakers back then of sub two because they wanted to hire me. 
Um, I didn't end up working for any of them, although I made good friends. I just told them my problem. I said, I just left this company. I know how to close deals. You guys just saw me close two deals, but I don't want to work for someone and I don't want to spend a lot of money on marketing, cold calling systems, lists, et cetera. And that's when they suggested you should door knock foreclosures. If you know how to sell, if you know how to get a contract, door knocking is free, all the data is free, and you have time, you don't have a job you know, go out and door knock these foreclosures. And so I just took action on that. And that's why I used to call did you join that team by myself. By myself. Okay. Now hold on, because until now you kind of had it figured out that you need to learn. Yeah. Um, and you're not afraid of doing, but didn't you think it would be, wouldn't you have thought to join a team that's already up the curve and, you know, I can think- I think I would have joined a team if there was one immediately presented to me that was door knocking. But the only explanation that I can come up with is that there wasn't one in Orlando that was door knocking. And so I wasn't going to just sit on my butt. You know, I was like, this is what they said to do. I'm going to figure out how to do it. And I, I do remember watching all the door knocking and foreclosure videos in step two. And, and I took a lot of action based off of those videos. Yeah. Cause I remember Dennis was in, New Jersey. There were a bunch of people doing door knocking, but I don't know about Florida. I wasn't paying too much attention there, but <laughs> that's interesting. for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so you got out there and just started knocking and what happened? How did it go? Yeah, I started knocking. I got contracts right away. Foreclosures are some of the most motivated leads. I tell anyone today who has the time and the, the bandwidth, the mental capacity uh, to door knock if they're looking for a deal. So some of the best deals, and they have they immediately have to get rid of their problem. They have a pressing problem with more motivation than almost any lead I've ever seen. So I got contracts right away. I started making money. My largest door knocking assignment was forty eight thousand dollars in one check as an 18 year old girl. You know, so I was like, this works, you know, like, let's freaking this go. works. You think? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Cool. Yeah. Now. When did you start developing your own team? Because I know you had one. Yeah, this is a really interesting period because I was door knocking and you can only do so many as one individual. There's tons of houses and people took interest. The reason people took interest is because I was uploading on YouTube my whole journey. I was like, here's how I'm door knocking. Like no one, there's only a couple people teaching this. I'm going to teach it too. And I was uploading my whole journey. And because I was educating, and this has been my journey even to this day, because I was educating, people wanted to join me. People wanted to lock hands and, and come and come with me. And so I started hiring these people on commission. I said, I'll give you everything. I'll give you the education. I'll give you the leads. And you go and door knock if you close something or if you call me in. I think the structure was based at the appointment for me. You call me in to close something, then I will uh, give you a commission. And that was okay for a while. Door knocking is really hard. There was a lot of churn because people you know, didn't have the time or they didn't have the mindset or whatever it was. But it was really interesting. That was my first time leading a team. I was 18, you know, talking to people who were 35, 40, you know, with kids at home, trying to help them, you know, make money door knocking. It was a very interesting position for me. I learned a lot about leadership. I I can, like I told you before the podcast started, I know now that the maturity that I have has aided a lot in building the team that I have now. Me dealing with people back then, you know, I, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about company vision or making someone stick to the company, getting core values. I was just like, whoever has a heartbeat and wants to make money, come and door knock with me, you know? That's funny. 